Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu everyone and welcome to the first lecture in Basira Forum's new series, The First Pillar, The Proofs of God's Existence. My name is Radia. I am the president of the Sira Forum and will be the MC for tonight. And we are just so excited to be able to bring the first of our lecture series to you today by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I pray that it is beneficial for all of us. Um, as we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we are joining you today. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'm going to firstly very quickly run through a few housekeeping notes. So to ensure the best online experience for yourself and for everyone else, we ask that you please keep yourself on mute throughout the lecture. Um, inshallah, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So please submit your questions through the link I'm pasting into the chat right now. Um, this lecture is also being recorded and will be made available to you all in the coming days, inshallah. But don't worry, your names and faces won't be shown in that. Um, also, we will be having a 10 minute break for Maghrib Salah um, about halfway through the meeting. Um, so we ask that you all stay logged in and just tune back in after that 10 minute break, inshallah. So before I introduce our esteemed speaker for today's lecture, I'd like to give a very brief introduction to the series. The first pillar is a three week lecture series that aims to address the doubts regarding the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a recognizable need to reconnect and to redevelop our faith and our conviction in the truth of Islam, particularly in a time where distractions are abundant and misinformation is so easily spread, it's only natural that many in the Muslim community, particularly the youth, are questioning the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this lecture series, we aim to prove the existence of God by discussing the creation of the universe and the perfection and precision of natural phenomena. There is an innate human need to believe in a higher power one that we will never fully understand, but cannot dispute. And that is our focus. Inshallah, over the next three weeks, we hope to create a safe space where doubts are welcomed as we provide comprehensive evidence for the existence of one true God. In today's lecture, we will hear from a very special speaker to discuss the existence of God, proof through creation, as we aim to explain the arguments that prove only a being could create the universe. It is my pleasure to introduce Ustad Abdullah Al Andalusi, an international speaker and intellectual activist for Islam and Muslim affairs, who is joining us today all the way from the UK. Ustad Abdullah is an instructor at the Quran Institute and co founder of the Muslim Debate Initiative. He has many years' experience explaining and demonstrating the intellectual proofs of the existence of Allah. So that makes him an expert on today's topic, inshallah. With that being said, I will hand over to Ustad Abdullah. Okay. Jazakallah khairan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil alameen. As-salatu wassalamu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi Kareem. Alhamdulillah. Alayhi wa sallam. Nabi Kareem. I'm, um, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers at uh, Basira Forum uh, and the Sheikh uh, for inviting me uh, to talk about this um, much needed topic, which is, um, establishing a kind of firm pillar for our beliefs and our, our uh, creed uh, in namely uh, the belief in one God. Uh, so inshallah, without, I'll kind of go uh, into some of this discussion. Um, the, the, the Quran offers, has a number of different discussions on, um, on, on God's existence. There are a kind of two angles that the Quran approaches the, the discussion of God full stop. One of them is um, the verses which we see in the Quran that talk about the heavens, heavens and the earth. Um, we see that uh, a big kind of angle that it's approaching that does these topics with is to discuss to a polytheist audience how the universe can only have one creator behind it, not multiple creators, or there can't be more than one um, deities that are controlling the, 
uh, everything in the universe or that are causing it to exist. Otherwise, there would be much um, kind of fraction and uh, there'd be much kind of contradiction within the universe itself. Um, as the laws of, of, of physics will start, will be changing constantly and the, uh, there'll be a, a kind of a contradiction between two wills that are behind everything, which can't be the case. Um, but also the uh, the Quran, which has many layered meanings and has is always relevant in any day and age to any audience in this day and age, we see that the, one of the main challenges to theism is not polytheism or monotheism, rather, but it's not polytheism, but is rather um, a, a type of atheism. Uh, some would say that atheism and polytheism share similar characteristics in that the polytheists would attribute to, to the divinity um, finitude or would attribute to finite things divine qualities. So um, in, in essence, these things haven't really moved on or changed since the past, uh, because ultimately speaking, humans always attempt to attribute to the creator um, uh, finite attributes or the attribute to finite things, um, something uh, the attributes of the creator like eternality. Um, so in this case, we're going to go into dis discussing the the current so-called alternative theories to God's existence and alternative explanations behind the universe. Um, so one of the particular, now many people get confused with regards to theoretical physics um, because they, they believe that uh, if a person is a physicist and they have, they present a spec, what is really a speculation on their part, um, and they dress it up with scientific, uh, well, I say scientific language, but rather they, they dress it up with um, jargon from theoretical physics, and it sounds very complicated and um, almost mysterious. Uh, they think, well, well, this must be a viable argument made by this physicist because they are physicists, they're, they are renowned, and they are atheists, and they're making an argument of how the God, how universe comes into being uh, without a creator. The issue is that. Um, it's a reason why it's called theoretical physics and not actual physics is because this is in the realm of speculation. And kind of a lot of what I tried to do is I try to show that if you examine these theories, these scientific theories, you'll, you'll see that they, they are speculative. Whereas when we kind of look through uh, and understand the possible causes behind the universe, uh, what we do is we, we're not like postulating something that exists that we need to verify empirically, like there's a teapot orbiting the sun. You have to verify that empirically. You can make the claim, but if there's no um, actual, you're making a claim about something inside the universe, which we haven't seen. So that requires to be justified. But we're not discussing about whether God exists inside the universe or not. We're discussing what are the only possible uh, explanations for the existence of the universe itself, um, i.e., uh, what is the cause of the universe? At, you know, and does the universe have a cause? Does it need a cause? These are the most fundamental questions, the much more fundamental questions that um, we we kind of we, we look into. And in essence, we, uh, as as human beings with rational minds, um, ask these re much more fundamental questions than someone who's merely exploring the universe to find out what's inside the universe. And of course, to find out what's inside a box, you have to open the box. But we're not talking about what's inside a box. We're talking about where does the box come from? <laughs> and, and so it's a different question entirely. So an empiricist is very va valid to be empirical, as in to um, deduce things or to, to search for things that are apparent to the empiricist by observation inside uh, the, 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 this box of a universe, so to speak. But we are talking about the box itself. It's a different subject matter entirely. And um, some atheist empiricists, they uh, kind of misapply empiricism to that which is uh, beyond the empirical, um, but it exists ne nevertheless. So the origin of this universe, we'll never be able to observe it directly. We can we can never observe it directly. Uh, and also fundamentally, um, the existence and being inside this universe, what actually, what is, what is the smallest thing, let's say, made out of, let's just say, um, an empiricist could never fathom. 
um, or would never be able to even verify or, or, or know because in order to understand what things are made of, we, the, the things need to be made of something smaller. And if, this, there, if there is a smallest thing, um, then we would never be able to understand what that thing is even made out of because it's not made out, we can't break it down to anything further. Um, and so empiricism is very limited in as a, as, a, as a tool in what it can do. It can only look at things which are composites and and basically analyze how much of a of, of a smaller thing that a thing is made out of, let's say. Um, and and it and it can't, it's limited by time. Um, empiricism can't go to the origins of all things to make a direct observation uh, of, of, of the origins of all things. So um, let's start with something basic, and then we'll go to a bit more um, a kind of, you could say, a more advanced um, theoretical physical models, which are speculated um, to be an ex explanation behind the universe. So let's look at the Big Bang. So people say, um, now, now, interestingly enough, uh, many atheists were against the idea of the Big Bang because they, uh, many atheists were for the idea of um, a kind of, uh, you could say, uh, unchanging eternal universe. Uh, so the universe has always looked the way it has been, and it's looked at, and it's always been around um, uh, forever in the past. Now, this uh, theory or this idea. Uh, was something that didn't require, from their view, the existence of God to explain, because if the universe has always been the way it was, it's eternal, it doesn't need a creator. However, when it was noticed, um, when there was obviously redshift uh, in um, kind of light spectrum of light waves re reaching us, um, it was seen that things are moving away from us, ourselves, and they're moving away in every direction. Um, it became undeniable to postulate that the universe is expanding so either we are right at the very even if we are right at the very middle of the universe and everything's moving away from us um that would be a demonstration of expansion but obviously we're it's most unlikely we're right in the middle of the universe but still everything is moving away from us um in all directions and so the universe is basically is, is expanding space and time itself is expanding so if it's expanding then it must it must have come from a from an origin point um, to space and time. Um, and that's basically as far as the, we've got in terms of um, what we can demonstrate physically. Um, for, well, what is an explanation for the physical data we can observe? Now, that's where then the physicists have to, many physicists, um, because there are many, there are a large majority of physicists who are theists, and there are also um, a, a large proportion of them who are atheists. Um, science doesn't really back up um, one way or the other um, in terms of direct observation. Um, but it's the explanations behind what we observe which cause the th physicists to diverge uh, into being theist or monotheist, uh, theist or atheist. So wh while we can show that the universe was ex has been expanding, the uh, you can't say, I suppose, empirically that you know what happened uh, that caused it, what caused it to expand, or you don't, you know what happened um, uh, um, you know, uh, like, did it come from a, a singularity, like a small, tiny point? Um, or was it just a small ball and then expanded? So a ball of certain size and it then expanded. Um, there's, there's a number of things that um, inflation can't really explain um, empirically. And now the question is, now the speculation comes in by the physicists. They try to now fill in the gap of what could cause uh, a inflating universe. So... I'm going to, without using more complicated jargon, I'll keep it nice and simple. There are a few basic models which are posited. So one you could say is a, let's say, a cyclical model. So one model say, states that um, maybe the universe uh, has been expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting in the, eternally in the past. And we're, we're, no, we're now just currently in a, in a particular expansion, and then it will go into a type of contraction. Um, now, that was a type of cyclical model, uh, but the problem with that model is that it brings in infinity into the finite, uh, and that, in a sense, infinity in time. That means that the past, there was an infinite amount of universes in the past, um, expanding and then contracting to get to this point. 
The problem with that is, is that infinity is not completable. You can't complete infinity. If you can complete it, it's finite. Right? If you can complete counting infinity, um, it, it's, it's actually then finite. What that means is that our past um, has to be uncompletable to get to this point in time. But that doesn't make any sense because if the past is uncompleted, and we know that to arrive at a particular point in a, let's say, a, a dependent chain of, of let's say, causes, um, you'd have to complete infinity, and we'd never arrive at this point. You'd, it's like me saying that uh, this lecture will end after I finish an infinitely long presentation. Will it ever, <laughs> will, will it ever end? Or if before this lecture was to begin, the host was to announce that um, I'll be speaking shortly in an infinite amount of time, we would never start this, the presentation. I'll never get to start the presentation. Um, and that's a problem which, again, physicists and the, and the models, um, they, many of the atheists who speculate this kind of model um, really uh, don't really want to kind of address. Um, and instead, they'll try to make arguments like, oh, well, maybe you can have um, infinities in mathematics. They try to make this argument. And so it, maybe there is an infinity in the finite in our past. Um, and again, uh, even though George Cantor talked about things like infinite sets, it was not really an uh, infinite set of numbers. The numbers cannot be um, infinite. Many people tell me, many, some atheists have told, told me, uh, the, the, in, the number line is infinite. And I say, but there is no number line. And they say, well, but there's, you know, there's like an infinite amount of numbers. And I say, well, no, in the decimal system, there's only 10 numbers. You know, uh, one to nine and then zero, <laughs> uh, 10 numbers um, uh, in a decimal system, of course. Uh, uh, what we do is mathematics uses a counting rule, which is that any, any number we can conceive of, we can think of, or we can represent with our computation machines, uh, we can represent by using the decimal system. That's it, that's, 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 that's all it is. Um, and George Cantor never really proved that infinity exists in mathematics, but rather um, he basically, in essence, um, you could say, imagine the number line as a set and just called it a set in a way. And then, and then it's like me saying that I have a bag and the bag contains infinite bags, right? Or a bag contains infinite things. Um, the bag is finite, but I'm going to tell you to think of the contents of the bag as being infinite. Uh, or having infinite number of, of certain things. Uh, and that's it. And then, you know, if I get well, that bag and I get a second bag that also has infinite infinite number of things, I have two bags of, of two infinities. Um, but in practice, in physics, there is no infinity in physics. Um, and of course, whenever um, in, the, in the universe there's no infinity, in mathematics there's no infinity. There's just, um, it's like me saying I can prove infinity is, is in mathematics by drawing the the kind of inf infinity symbol, you know? It's sort of, it looks like a, an, a number eight turned sideways, yeah? That doesn't prove infinity exists in mathematics. Um, and whenever an infinity is predicted by a physical model, um, i.e. a mathematical model to represent um, some thing, something that's observed in the physical world, uh, whenever an infinity is predicted by the equation, this physicist will tell you that's when we know the equation's incorrect. So whenever uh, the equation ever gets to, let's say, um, a one divided by zero, um, basically, um, then it's gonna, which equals infinity and will cause an error in your calculators, um, they know that the equation or breaks down. They, they say, they call it the equation breaks down. It doesn't explain um, uh, this particular reality. And of course, quantum mechanics was discovered because a previous equation broke down. Um, it imagined energy to be um, infinitely divisible. And energy actually is discrete in quanta, right? It's actually in discrete packets. And that's how they discovered quantum mechanics. It was because the previous model, which assumed energy could be divided infinitely, produced errors that didn't match the, exp the experimentation and predicted um, infinity. Uh, and then they discovered that, well, this can't be right. And then they, they to their surprise, discovered that energy is not infinitely divisible but is broke, can, be, can be broken down into quanta, quantum packets, small packets of energy, the smallest packets of energy. Um, so there is no if infinity in, uh, in physics, 
Um, and anything that predicts infinity, i.e. any equation whereby if you put the numbers in, um, in an equation that is meant to model something we can observe, uh, and, and it ends up with a one divided by zero at some point, <clears throat> um, that, that means the equation is incorrect or doesn't, it doesn't deal with every situation, um, in essence. And there's, that many physicists would basically explain to you um, if, if a singularity is predicted, i.e. an infinity, um, then that's basically, they, there's a problem with the, the equation itself and they have to use renormalization. <clears throat> renormalization is when they try to rejig the equation to, um, or rejig the results to, um, so re rejig the equation to, to come to a, a result closer to what they can observe empirically. See? Mathematical models <clears throat> are based upon, um, you could say, very simplified assumed assumptions. So if I see a ball that's bouncing on the ground and the ball, <clears throat> it bounces and, it, um, and every time it bounces, it bounces to half the, the height of what it bounced before and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. <clears throat> Mathematics would predict that the ball would would continue bouncing forever, inf infinitely, for infinite amount of time, um, because it will never reach zero. But the mathematical equations assume that the ball has zero point, uh, um, uh, point mass, so it's a, it's a, the mass is centered in a small point of it. There's no energy loss um, in gravity, and there's no um, deformation of the ball, which also, also involves energy loss as the ball bounces. Uh, all the things that are, exist in the physical world um, and so it is, it's basically a, mathematical models <clears throat> are simplified models of the world which don't represent the world itself, um, uh, but are, are useful for rough approximations, rough approximation. But they are useful, but, if, but sometimes these models break down when you go into the details because they don't match reality 100%, and especially when they produce um, predictions of um, of, of singularities or infinity infinities in these models. Um, so that's, uh, anyway, that's, that's, that's the, the first part of my presentation is to show um, that um, people shouldn't get confused with, with um, theoretical physics um, speculations dressed up as valid scientific theories. Um, the, the speculations can still be irrational and still contain contradictions, um, but because uh, many theoretical physics are willing to let's say, live with those contradictions, or um, in a way, uh, hope that you don't mind those contradictions, or you don't notice those contradictions, uh, they get away with making certain, um, getting away with making certain claims. Um, and uh, um, I think before, well, I'll give you one final example, and then we'll break up for um, the mug of the prayer in where you are at. Of course, here it's early in the morning, it's 9.30 in the morning, of course. Um, so, um, Alexander Vilenkin, is a theoretical physicist, and he posited um, an idea that um, the universe could come from nothing by itself. Um, and what he did is he said that uh, quantum nucleation occurs, so something, it, it has a, um, a non-zero probability, he said, which means that he says that like, basically uh, um, th there could be a quantum fluctuation, let's say, um, just appearing out of nothing. Uh, out of nothing, uh, and, and that possibility is not zero. It's very small, but not zero. Um, and then once we start with that premise, eventually you can explain that once a quantum fluctuation happens and reaches a certain threshold, uh, we now then have, uh, once it reaches a certain threshold, that threshold from the, as a starting point, we have the physical models to uh, at least um, make a possible, possible claim that once a quantum fluctuation at a certain threshold will cause um, the uh, a universe to come into existence and expansion to occur. Now, while the mathematical models um, or the, model, the, the models which are produced, um, which show that there is, when there is a, a kind of quantum nucleation that reaches a certain level for a certain threshold uh, in order to generate uh, kind of negative gravity, the thing that, kind of, it, that causes an expansionist kind of force, um, while that model um, could be a possibility as to once there is a quantum nucleation, the cause of quantum nucleation itself, he just hoped that you wouldn't ask too many questions about why he said that was not zero and why it could have come into existence. Um, 
the best way to explain this, to give you an analogy now, because I probably used to, just, I want to keep this as simple as possible, is it's like me saying, um, if I was to inspect every oven in in the country I'm in, every oven, there is a, I mean, the majority of ovens are going to probably not have a cake in it. But there is a non-zero probability that there'll be an oven somewhere that has a you know like a, a piece of dough with yeast in it or whatever you let's say or let's say bread or cake or whatever and that produces um a cake or a, a loaf of bread or something like that so and we can explain from uh from we have a mathematical model to show that from a dough that has yeast a dough with yeast will expand and um, produce a loaf of bread and you say that that's all very great that might be you know the case that is the case most likely is the case but where did the dough come from with the yeast? You just said we could find it, it, there's a non-zero probability that it can be we can find it in in um, uh, in any particular oven we look at randomly for all the ovens that exist in the country, um, and now we, and then once it exists, we have a model to explain how it could expand. Well, that's all great about how you explain it expanded from initial condition, but what caused that initial condition? You didn't explain that. You're just hoping that um, people don't ask that question. Right. And that's the the kind of fallibility behind their speculation. It is a speculation which starts off with an irrational postulate. Just it's it's just making a claim, and then hoping that you don't investigate it further, and then saying, right, well, once we I've made this claim that this exists, we can now explain how it could have expanded. Well, that's great. How it could have expanded might have been your 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 um, models might predict exactly how it expanded from that initial point or piece. But you didn't explain where that piece comes from. You're just saying that something, in essence, comes from nothing, and you're hoping that people don't notice you're saying that because you're dressing it up with, um, with, with, with um, hiding it behind, let's say, probability. But probability uh, is it doesn't really explain anything. It just probability is basically um, our way of measuring things that we don't know, we can't decisively predict um, from its cause. So we don't know. We can't guarantee it will always be um, caused by something, or um, or we can't guarantee that it would it would always come into come about. So we have something to measure that called probability. So if I flip a coin, I can't guarantee myself to generate a heads or tails, but I can say, well, if I flip it twice, um, you know, then I, there's a higher probability of getting a heads than I, if I just flipped it once, for example. Um, that, that all that means that all the possible outcomes, um, you know, that the probability of heads and tails are equal. They're equal to each other, and the the probability is um, you get a probability of uh, of let's say you know one in two, let's say, uh, but that's not guaranteed, right? You could flip it four times and not get heads, let's say, but that that's a small probability. Um, that's what probability measures. Probability doesn't tell you what causes something. It's just a measure of the effects. What is the likelihood of the effect being a particular effect? That's it. And so that's where um, some theoretical phys physicists who want to not involve God in the equation, um, they try to hide, uh, hide the, the, the lack of a cause by dressing it up in something to distract you with, by saying, oh, no, it's probability, randomness. Um, as if randomness is, is a god that can create. Um, randomness is is a, again what we what we uh, something we give to effects. Effects are random, as in we can't determine uh, or we see no order in an effect. But that doesn't explain the cause. Still doesn't explain the the cause of those things. Anyway, um, so before we, we, we go to the second part, and Ashallah will break up for Maghrib, and and then uh, we'll discuss uh, rationally what can we what can we exclusively de deduce. Um, behind the, or let's say, infer behind the cause of the universe, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, um, Ustad, a very interesting point to leave us on. Um, so yes, we will be having a short break now uh, for Maghrib Salah. And for our international attendees, this gives you a chance to stretch your legs and grab a snack if you'd like. Um, this is also everyone's opportunity to ask your questions through the link in the chat, as we will be running a Q&A session in the second half of the lecture, inshallah.
We will resume the talk in exactly 10 minutes from now, so 8.46, inshallah, and I ask that you are all kindly back on time so that we can continue with this very interesting discussion. See you very soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and welcome back to the second half of our lecture. Without any further ado, I'm going to hand it straight back to Ustad Abdullah to continue. Okay, Okay, so um, now we've got, inshallah, the, the physics out of the way, um, we can start using our, uh, our rational minds to uh, see what we can infer from what we can ob observe. Um, the whole point of the intellect is to basically make inferences beyond what we can see. Um, may, many animals react simply to what they see, although some possess instinctual, uh, you could say a type of instinctual knowledge um, in that they prepare for things that they don't see, like storing away food for, for the winter, for hibernation, or uh, bees designing um, hexag hexag hexagonal kind of storage um, place for the, for the honey at different parts of of the hive, and they end up perfect, you know, meeting together in the middle, and it's a perfect, perfectly fitting structure. Um, so if we don't really use our intellects um, and we just say we will we'll only believe what we see, um, and I'll only we'll only discuss what we can, we'll only uh, we won't go beyond what we can see. Then there's no point having the intellect because the intellect, the whole point of it is to make uh, deductions and inferences for from what we can see to what we can't see. So let's kind of start with two, you could say two basic approaches. And as I will show, um, these approaches are actually are in the Quran. They're all in the, the book, they're all from the Quran. Um, the first point would be, let's look at what we can see. So we know, let's look at time as one example. Now time, um, to you know what is what is time how do you measure time a time can only be measured by looking at something that has a um a, a motion of something that returns to its same position uh, at a regular uniform amount of time so for example the the orbit of the sun um or clock for example are examples of things which they return to a state uh, which they were before, and they will constantly, they're in motion, but they'll constantly return back to the same state um, at regular intervals uh, and equal equidistant intervals. So that's, that's in a way the only way you can ever measure time at all whatsoever. And I, I just want to, I want to make that point because we'll see later on how, how interesting um, it matches up to what the Quran says. So, okay, um, we have, we have, the Earth ro ro rotating around, the, sort of moving around the Sun, orbiting the Sun. Uh, we have the Sun orbiting the center of the of this, our galaxy, and of course we have the Earth rotating on its axis. So we have a lot of rotational um, things to look at that to measure time. Now, if we look at because things are changing and things have, have been changing uh, for some time, the question is: Have things been rotating and changing, so to speak, for an eternity past, or was there a beginning? Well, as I said before, if time in the past uh, was infinite, then we would take an infinite amount of time to get to this point. Um, but infinity doesn't complete itself. You can't be, infinity can't be completed, and therefore we would never reach this point in time. Therefore, there was a start point to time itself. Time really just being what we call change. Time being the re the regular uh, the regularities of what we see behind change, and so if there was an infinite change in the past, um, then there has to be a first change, a you know a, f a first beginning change of some kind. But now the question is, well, before change, what was there? Well, there was non-change, and non-change by definition can't go into change by itself. Um, there has to be something that initiated the change, has to be an initiating factor to something which uh, doesn't change to then initiate change to happen. So what could be that, that cause that initiates change, you know, initiates time itself? Well, 
either it's basically let's look at the possibilities so either um it was happened by let's say randomness but randomness doesn't is not really an explanation randomness just says that the effect happens and it's unpredictable but it doesn't tell us anything about the cause nothing at all so that's not really an explanation it's rather in need of an explanation uh so then what's left well the only possibility left is since change doesn't can't come spontaneously from absolute a state of absolute non change um and there can't be infinite change in the past then the only thing you're left is that there is something that initiated change but what are the what is the attribute of something that can initiate change well if it was a, an an automated mechanism it's like maybe a you know a, a big a massive clock or a cosmic clock of some kind um and it was programmed to initiate create universes let's just say the question would arise what makes the clock make you know what makes this cosmic cause make universes or this cosmic factory make universes well if you were to say what well, commit it has an internal mechanism that is um that, that is moving and it makes it make universes i say okay but then what's Well, this movement of this eternal of this so-called eternal let's say factory or eternal clock um it has it has it always, has it always been moving in the past inside itself its mechanism has always been moving or, or what have you if, if you say yes then we're right back to where we start which is you're having an eternity past of change um in this case inside this factory or this universal this cosmic factory or this cosmic clock and you still haven't explained anything Uh, so there has to be there has to be an absolute beginning to change that is not something that's automatic or mechanistic but has to be initiated now if it's not automatic or mechanistic if it's not coming from nothing so it must come uh, because nothing doesn't from nothing nothing comes as the greek philosopher uh, lucretius said um then what what is this what is something that can cause um cause something to come to existence and what we find is that if you think about it there really is no other um there is no other possibility um other than this something is an existent something because it has to exist and it initiates it initiates change and if the only way it can initiate change if it there's nothing there's no mechanism that is making it initiate change um is that it has to choose it it has to in essence initiate it by choice uh by will and uh, in a way the a free will the only free will if you actually if you truly think about it or the only real real free free will um and this is something that has will and can initiate change from nothing if something can initiate change from nothing um then it can add energy it can create energy or create movement from from nothing and if it can create movement or change um or energy from nothing uh then it is inexhaustible its power uh, a power power means your ability to cause an effect um is then unlimited because if you can create from nothing a state of nothing or no change change or adding something to reality this thing can add to reality um and therefore if it can add to reality itself um uh, it has un- it is unlimited and omnipotent in power because to be able to add to reality itself means that you're inexhaustible uh, because you you're not if you had a store of energy and you just use a store of energy um that the you the store could run out now you might say well how do you know that this creator doesn't have a store of energy and then just decides to take from that store and make things out of it uh but to to move, let's say to move um energy from a store to actually doing something when that energy wasn't doing anything before still requires energy itself in a way <laughs> so to even move the move something from a storage to being used requires energy and if it you have to be to move that stored energy so to speak um and to do that you need to add energy into where it was no none before so any way you look at it this omnipotent being it is can create energy from nothing can create movement from nothing or change from nothing 
um, it can add to reality. And it does so by choice because anything else produces a contradiction. Um, to say it has an, an internal mechanism, uh, then that mechanism needs to be explained as in what is the infinite, um, an infinite change that's happening inside this internal me me mechanism from the past. Um, how can it do anything um, if, it were, if it requires an infinite past to be completed in order for it to uh, create a, um, a universe? Like if I had a factory and the factory was making universes and to make our universe, this factory had to have produced infinite universes in the past um, or infinite uh, infinite products to get to our, us, it wouldn't be able to, we would never reach this point in the creation cycle of this factory. Um, and again, the, the, the in, because infinite past, um, an infinite past of change is basically um, an infinite past of, of dependent changes each one depends on the one before it, um, really can't explain, can't exist, and will produce a contradiction uh, in that you're, you're waiting to complete something uncompletable. So the time itself demonstrates the existence, the necessary requirement to of there being a creator that caused change from no change, and the, to, to be able to do so demonstrated that he is of infinite power and infinite um, potential. And of course, um, then, then the question is, the next question is, of course, is that, well, why this specific universe? Why not a different universe um, of, of some kind? Now, someone might say, well, and some atheists have tried to get around this by saying maybe there are infinite universes of every particular variety you can imagine, um, which I find quite obviously funny because um, many, some atheists using rhetoric, they use a particular rhetoric. They say, oh, we don't believe in God like we don't, we don't believe in fairies, goblins, and unicorns. And I say, well, um, if, you have, if you have infinite universes, um, you do believe in fairies, goblins, and unicorns. And I say, well, how so? And I say, well, because if there are infinite universes with every possible um, thing that could exist, would, would exist in one of these universes, then out there somewhere in this multiverse, there is goblins, unicorns, and fairies, and that would mean that they exist. Gobl you, because you insist that there are infinite universes out there of every particular variety, you have to exist. You have to believe in fairies, goblins, and unicorns, whereas we, we, we wouldn't believe so because we don't have any evidence for that. Um, and that, I find that quite um, ironic. Um, however, even to posit that there are infinite universes with every possible um, kind of universe of different, even with different laws of, of physics, still needs to explain why any one particular universe um, and not, not, not another. So it's like if, let's say I had an infinite factory and the factory produced infinite things, like, uh, like um, it produced uh, cars, it produced... Uh, mobile phones, it produced beach balls. And at one, at any one moment, let's say one moment it produces a, a type of one, a, a type of, um, Android phone, let's say. And then another moment it produces a flat screen TV. The question is why at that one moment it produced a flat screen TV and not a car, let's say, even though it makes cars as well and it does so, but why not? that particular thing being uh, was a flat screen TV and not a car, let's say, a particular car. And, and, and let's say it, when it produces a car, it produces, let's say, a type of BMW. Um, why not a type of Audi? Um, there still needs to be an explanation for why um, there is something is made in one particular way and not another particular way for that, for its own instance, for it, its own instance of existence. Why does this universe have certain constants, certain laws of physics, and not a different law of physics? And they say, oh, that's because um, what the, there are other universes out there that have different laws of physics. Say, no, 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 I'm not asking about them. I'm asking about this universe. Why this particular law of physics for this universe? The specificity of this particular universe needs to be explained. And if they say, well, it was done by randomness, again, that's not an explanation. You're not talking about causes, you're talking about effects. Anyone that mentions the word random, you're talking about the effects, you're not talking about causes. You need to explain why this particular universe, having the particular attributes it does have, and not different attributes. 
Positing that there are other other universes that have different attributes doesn't explain anything. You're just saying that there are other things that also need explanation. You're increasing the burden of explanation, not decreasing it, by positing that there are other universes. So the this particular universe, how it is made, um, the, the the specific things that occur in this universe, um, the specific laws of physics that that uh, govern uh, are, and are behind the regularities we see in this universe. That needs to be explained too. Why those particular laws, when other laws can be conceived of, and that is something again that, uh, that even um, theoretical physicists they um, argue that they, they, they don't have an explanation for why the, a particular set of, of physics itself, why the particular set of laws. Um, there's, there's also now a third argument I bring, which is um, everything in the universe is dependent and or, or contingent as some people like to say they call it the contingency argument but i want to i kind of want to use something i want to use more plain english so i'll just say let's say everything in this universe is dependent now the argument uh, that if you have everything in the universe is dependent the sum total of dependent things is dependent and you can't have existence only of dependent things uh, and nothing and no independent thing to be the basis the anchor for all things which are dependent now, a dependent thing is basically something whose existence depends on something else uh, and not in of itself. Uh, and uh, you can't have a universe or, or of everything which its existence depends on something external to itself. Um, let me give you an analogy to understand this. So let's say, um, you know, I, I use this example quite typically. So let's say there's a, 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 a food vending machine that has a chocolate bar and there are people that want that chocolate bar but they have no money there's one person that wants it but has no money but wants that chocolate bar so they ask they ask their friend do you have some money um to 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 use on that chocolate can you lend me some money i want because i want to go and get that chocolate bar out of the machine but his friend doesn't have um any money then he asks his friend and his friend also doesn't have any money and he asks that his friend and his friend and so on so on and so forth even if you had an infinite amount of people who were, who were asked to let be lent money to get that chocolate bar out of that machine, if they were all poor, um, at poor to the point they don't have any money at all whatsoever, then even if you ask an infinite amount of, let's say, these hypothetical poor people, you wouldn't get that, you wouldn't have any money to get that chocolate bar out of the machine. There has to be someone who has money and initiates the lending process. So even in, it says, all right, I'll lend it to you and you can lend it to him and lend it to him and her and him and her, whatever, and all the way down to the, all the way down the chain to someone who actually wants to get the chocolate bar out of the machine. So a universe of which only has dependent things in it, um, and, there, and if there is no nothing else that exists outside it or whatever, there's just this universe of dependent things, would not explain how this universe comes into um, why everything is the way it is and and where it comes from and in essence why and the origin of these dependent things who their existence depends on something else. Now someone says, well, ah, but how do you know everything in the universe is dependent, right? How do you know this, right? Maybe they just they all are independent. Well, let's look at let's understand that, shall we? By looking at the opposite. So what would it, what is a independent thing? An independent thing is something which their existence is not dependent on anything outside itself. It exists um, due to its own sustaining property. It sustains itself, um, and it does. It, it has no. It can't have any connection to anything else uh, outside itself. It's not because it's not dependent on anything outside itself. Something that is independent can't be then affected by anything outside itself because its own existence, which by um, kind of consequence, the the mode of its existence um, is only dependent on itself, right? So it determines how it exists and what it, uh, uh, and and it, uh, what it does. If that's the case, then it can't be interacted with by anything outside itself. Uh, it is um, independent truly from anything outside itself. But what we witness is that everything in this universe um, is dependent because it interacts with each other and it affects each other. But also, if there was something that was independent, it wouldn't be in a universe of dependent things. It would be detached, in a way, from a universe of dependent things. 
So only the only things that can exist in this universe, so to speak, uh, that we would say are inside, are inside, are things which are dependent anyway. And if they are dependent and they affect each other, then there has to be um, there has to be uh, something independent that is not interactable, um, but uh, uh, and is detached from us, but upon which all things depend. And that, of course, is something independent. And if it's independent, the question is, if it's independent, uh, why did it even make dependent things in the first place? And again, if it is independent, it doesn't need to make um, th um, things which are not dependent, but those dependent things can't be made by themselves or can't exist by themselves and are therefore, um, therefore they, they are, uh, they need an explanation. And so the thing that basically is independent makes dependent things voluntarily and not out of necessity. Otherwise, these dependent things wouldn't be dependent. They'd be part of the independent thing itself. And so we end with the conclusion that the universe itself um, is has to be dependent by the, the very fact that what exists in this in this universe that interacts with each other has to be dependent, and what is independent cannot be um, part of, of of a universe of dependent things. And but but is must exist to explain why there is a universe of dependent things. I, I have another argument, uh, which I call an argument from space and time, that I can show how in both space and time, or both, uh, that but space demonstrates things are things that have space or have extension um, are also dependent. And also, um, I can. Uh, there's an argument for, for time that I also have um, discussed, which also includes an argument that looks at um, what they might say is a, a block block time. And shows how that block time must also be uh, must also um, require a, a creator to cause it to its existence. But that's a bit more advanced stuff, which I won't really go into here. However, I will finish off by simply saying that um, in the in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, verse one hundred and ninety, it says, "In the creations of the heavens and the earth." and the difference of night and day, or the alternation of night and day, these are signs for men of al-albab, um, understanding. Um, we also see that surely in the alternations of night and day, and in, what, and in what Allah has created in the heavens and the earth, are signs for people who are God-fearing, for those people who are open, uh, who, who feel it in their fitrah, to believe in, um, in something that is, that is Powerful, and they are open to belief in it, and, and they fear uh, the consequence of not of disbelieving reality of things of that which are which which could be real. And then they open their minds to the prospect. When they then observe and look at the universe, they will see with certitude um, that in the alternations of night and day, and the creation of the heavens and the earth. And again, in, in another verse in Surah Al Baqarah, verse one hundred sixty-four, it says these are signs for those who use their intellect. Yeah. So what's it? why does the Quran say in the alternation of night and day? The alternation of night and day is the measurement of time. And so time itself is a demonstration and proof of God's existence. And in the, the creation of the heavens and the earth, the, ori the origination of those things as well demonstrates the existence of God. And so in a way, this the verse in the Quran is pointing us to look at both time and space, or things in space, and that both time and space demonstrate the existence of God, i.e. space-time demonstrates the existence of God. And this, this is a very um, wonderful verses, amazing verses in the Quran. They're all amazing, but this is very amazing in, in re relevance to knowing God's existence from that the alternation of night and day is how we measure time. That's, that's how we, we, because it's a, it's a cyclical system that returns back to uh, its original set of conditions, um, so to speak, relative to ourselves. And that's what we use to measure time. Time itself and the creation of the heavens and the earth, these dependent things are demonstrations of God's existence for those who use their intellect, for, for those who want to know the truth and fear rejecting the truth, the, those who have taqwa, and those who um, use their reason and understanding in al-albab. So that's basically three amazing verses in the Quran that in essence point to how these time and space itself 
are proofs of God's existence. So barakallahu feekum for listening and inshallah let's open up to questions and answers. Um, Jazakallahu khairan Ustad, that was incredibly insightful, may Allah reward you. Um, so it does look like we'll be going over time and I do apologize, um, but just a reminder that this is being recorded and will be made publicly accessible on our YouTube page, inshallah. Um, so we do have quite a few questions that have come through, alhamdulillah. Um, the first asks, with these theories, don't we assume that our rational systems hold true for what existed before the universe? And doesn't that make all theories inherently flawed? Okay, so there is a, um, there's a misperception that our thinking abilities are based on, um, or only would be valid for what happens inside this universe. When it, and we we are are thinking are based on on models of how the universe works and therefore we're trying to apply these outside the universe. Um, actually, it is the atheists that are guilty of this um, to use um, speculations about how the universe works and then trying to um, extrapolate or try to project that onto what happens outside the universe. So they say that basically what happens outside the universe is the same as what happens inside the universe, and, and so therefore the laws of physics always exist, and there's always a constant laws of physics that's always been around and producing universes and things like that, like bubble nucleation or what have you, um, uh, uh, in, in, in false vacuums, which is basically Alexander Velenkin's argument. Um, this is incorrect. We, it's not based on us using uh, man-made, human-made um kind of logics, it's us avoiding the contradiction that would be inherent in in arguing anything else is the, the ex explanation behind the universe. Now you might say, but the law of contradiction is a man-made law or the law of the universe. No, it's not. Um, it's called the law of non-contradiction because it just um, tells human beings to not contradict themselves, but it's not actually a law. It's just, and I mean this in the most fundamental way, it is reality itself, and I'll explain that. The law of contradiction is simply telling us something, if something exists, it can't, or it, it does not not exist, right? And if something doesn't exist, it can't exist at the same time. So what is reality is reality and is not to be contradicted by non-reality, I suppose. Or, and that's really all it is. So if something is, then it, it must be, um, it, it can't be, is not at the same time. Um, right? That's all it is. We call it the law of non-contradiction just to tell, because humans need to, need to call things laws. <laughs> just as we call, say, the laws of physics are basically, uh, we call it the laws of physics, but really it's just the regularities of the universe. The regularities that we see in the, uni in the universe in sim similar situations, we call these, we derive a model from that, a, a mathematical set of relations, and we call that a law. It's it's not a law um, in the sense of man-made law, law that we made and we impose it on the universe. It's just a, a way of, of us understanding and making a model of the regularities. And the law of non-contradiction is, is the most fundamental law there is um, for that we have, let's say, reminded ourselves of, in that it just simply states that if something exists, it does not not exist, right? And if something does not exist, then it does not exist, right? So that's all um, that's all it states. And if uh, if you were to say that this the universe has an eternal past, you're saying a contradiction that we have completed a non-completable um, series of dependent a chain of dependent things. That's a contradiction, and it's purely to avoid contradictions that we come to the only possible explanation that is that, that, that avoids contradiction, and that is that the, the existence of God who has a will and is um, omnipotent. That's incredibly interesting. Jazakallah um, khair. So the second question is, there is much technical jargon when discussing this topic. Are there any suggestions on how to start developing solid understanding in these matters as a beginner? The it, it it doesn't require you to to study physics. It doesn't require you to adopt advanced philosophical jargon. 
Um, you, you can do it quite simply. Um, I, I've tried to, I've consciously tried to um, avoid complicated jargon or f physics terms. Um, I've mentioned a few though, um, but I've tried to avoid it and keep it as simple as possible because it is actually quite simple. Um, the only thing that's made things complicated is the desire by those who hate the conclusion or don't want to, don't like the conclusion of a God. Uh, they use mental gymnastics and obfuscations, uh, words designed to cover up kufr, uh, words designed to cover up the truth or misdirect you from it or avoid. Um, so they don't, they don't, they don't want to say a universe comes from nothing. They'll say there's a non -ran there's a non zero probability uh, that in a false vacuum a bubble nuclear nu nu nucleation occurs. Like, wait, 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 rewind that a bit. So what what are you saying exactly? You see, it's because they cover up the basic contradiction inherent in their speculations, and by using jar jargon that we don't uh, most of us let's say would not admit, are not familiar with, or we we we, we think it's um, you know, uh, or even those who are physicists. Um, sometimes maybe um, forget or that uh, it, these, this jargon is designed to cover up the inherent contradiction. And, it, and it's much like a, has a, Christ, a Christian or an advanced Christian theologian would explain the Trinity to you. Um, they would use jargon. They would say that the, the God has um, one being but three persons and a person is not the same as being. And uh, they've used jargon uh, to cover up the basic inherent contradiction that they're saying three and one at the same time, um, you know, because God is defined as uh, one will and which is has, is omnipotent. If you had three wills which are all omnipotent, they they can do anything they want. They would limit each other and they wouldn't be omnipotent. And that's the contradiction. But the Trinitarian wants to hide that by giving you jargon um, and giving you words to confuse you. You don't need to know physics. To discuss this topic, you don't need to know philosophy or, or philosophical jargon to discuss this topic. But because the people who try to deny the obvious conclusion um, hide their own contradictions using jargon, uh, we have to, in a way, familiarize ourselves enough to, to, in a way, untangle it and say, no, you're contradicting yourself, and this is why you're contradicting yourself. Um, and that's only that's the only reason why anyone would ever delve into looking at this, this looking at jargon looking at physics and so on in the first place unless you want to be a physicist yourself or a philosopher so you don't need to know philosophy you don't need to know physics at all um but the only way i want the only reason i reference those things and i will discuss it is because people are confused by the claims made by these physicists um and there are theist physicists who who argue against them yeah, so just just know that. So, um, but if you want to familiarize yourself uh, with physics, uh, which I would suggest you do for its own sake, right? You're learning about the universe of, of, created by the Creator. So, I would almost say that physics is part of theology. Um, theology is the study of the will of the Creator, what He does, and and so on. And physics is a study of His will. So, um, learn it for that reason, um, mostly. Um, and yeah, pick up a primer book. And, and start equating yourself. There, there's a lot of popular science books, um, and, and but start equating yourself with it. It's a, it's a very interesting subject to go into. It's quite fun as well. I think you explained that really well. Thank you. Um, and I think the final question that we will answer for today is, what is the best response to atheists or scientists who mock the idea of God? Well, <laughs> mocking is not an argument. Um, it, I, when they use rhetoric, um, and again, uh, we could uh, retaliate um, in, in a similar manner, but not in a crude or childish manner, uh, by mocking their belief that they believe that something comes from nothing, um, or they believe in multiverses where there's um, fairies, goblins, and unicorns. Uh, they have to believe in fairies, goblins, and unicorns. Uh, that exists because they, these things are possible creatures um, in, in, in to some form, so a, a small type of uh, humanoid that has wings, a, a horse that has a horn growing from its head, uh, a small green thing with pointy ears. That that you can imagine universes where these exist um, and planets maybe in that, the, where that could exist in different universes, um, and therefore the atheist has to believe in in fairies, goblins, and unicorns. 
um, uh, with the stuff that they mock us for for um, by comparing God to that, even though God isn't a creature, isn't a limited thing inside a universe, but is the explanation for the, the reality that we are observing itself, fundamental explanation for reality itself. Um, so, so yeah, of course. Um, but also, you, if you want, I'll give you something more pertinent. You can also mock, uh, not mock, but you could just point out the limitations of physics, physics itself. Physics is about the relationship between things. Um, and it explains things that we see by reference, reference to the composites of it, like what it's made out of its substance. Um, the question is, is uh, you can just bring up um, Zeno's paradoxes on this. Um, uh, and ironically, the philosopher Zeno argued that reality didn't make sense um, because um, he said that reality is infinitely divisible um, and therefore you can't trust your senses because if things are made of something, then what are those things made out of? And then if that's made of something else, what's that made out of? And what's that made out of? What's that made out of? Um, in, ad infinitum. Um, and they, they came to the conclusion that there has to be an, an infinite thing behind all things, but their mistake, Zeno's mistake, and the school of thought that he was coming from, um, their mistake was that they believed that the, your senses are lying to you and the universe is itself just one unchanging and un indivisible thing, right? Which is like, no, it, it clearly is changing. And there are things, you know, like why, why, where is my observation coming from? Even if my senses are lying to me, I'm observing something and it's changing. So there is, you, that, that's impossible to exist inside an infinite unchanging thing. But the infinite unchanging thing does exist. It's just not this universe, but it's underpinning everything in this universe, i.e., it is causing the most basic substance to exist, um, even though the most basic substance isn't made out of anything. Um, but what gives it its attributes? Why does it do what it does if it's not made out of anything? Well, it's because it's being caused um, and it's being sustained. Right. And physics only measures the mathematical relationship between these basic forms of, of things. But it doesn't it can't tell you what the smallest thing is made out of. It, it cannot. It's the limit of physics. Physics just tells you, like, you know, let's say if a physicist, let's say, was to look at a game of football um, or soccer, uh, as the Americans call it, um, they would only measure the, the, the speed and uh, the position of the players, the ball, and where it is at any particular moment. That's all it could measure, let's say for the sake, for the sake of argument. It, couldn't, it wouldn't tell you what the ball or the, the people are made out of if, a phys if physics was, was about looking at football, let's just say, right? Because the fundamental unit would be the ball and the players. And I know that you could say, well, we, we do know what people are made out of, what balls are made out of, well, I know, but this is an, an analogy. Um, at the smallest units of matter, which um, maybe are quarks, maybe are you know, bosons and, and so on and so on and so forth, but, um, they may, but why do they have the properties that they have? Why do they do with it? Now, maybe they're made out of something else. Maybe. Maybe they're types of um, wavelengths and things. They're, they're waves. But again, what are waves made out of? What are these basic waves made out of? What is the vacuum, the so-called vacuum made out of? Um, what is space and time made out of? I could do that ad, ad infinitum. And if there is no answer, then uh, if you can divide reality up into infinitely, it's made out of nothing. And then, there, then why, where, why is there something when it's um, made out of infinitely divisible nothing, right? There has to be a basic layer to reality that is indivisible, but there has to be an explanation as to why it does what it does, and it can't be explained by what's inside it because it's not made out of anything else, so it can only be explained by what's outside it, i.e. something is sustaining this, the most basic units of reality and giving it its attributes and moving it around. Right? That's not an argument for God. That's almost going into my argument from space-time now, um, but that's the limits of physics. Physics can't go beyond the smallest units of reality, or even know it's even reached the smallest unit units of reality. It just measures what it does, like how, how it moves and where it moves. That's it. So you can mock physics and saying that your, your realm of study, interesting though it is, is fundamentally limited and cannot explain ultimately reality. I even have a video on my YouTube account on, about, about this one point. Um, so anyway, you can mock them back the, and mock the, the limitedness of their, um, their, their field. They, they, can, they study how, what beings do, but they don't study what being is ultimately, to put it in a nutshell.
Sakula Kerr, that was very uh, thought provoking. And, um, and also it's not just the Americans, it's soccer to us as well in Australia. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, that's unfortunately all the time that we have for today. Um, I apologize if we didn't get to your question, um, but just remember that you can ask any follow-up questions through the Basira website, um, which is now in the chat box there. Um, I just want to say Jazakallah Khair and Ustad Abdullah for your time today and for your incredibly engaging and beneficial talk. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on behalf of all of us at Basira Forum to protect and preserve you and to continue to increase you in wisdom and influence. Thank <laughs> you.